Uh, thank you guys so, so much for joining us. As I mentioned, we're going to be, we're about to start here with the album chat for The Time. We're going to be talking about the second album from The Time, What Time Is It, that celebrates its 38th anniversary today. 38th anniversary today. So we're going to be going in and we're going to be doing the album chat. And I want to make sure that you guys are ready because I told you that there was going to be a little bit of a the possibility of a little bit of a surprise for this broadcast. And that surprise has just tuned in and is waiting right now. Are you guys ready? I, I, I just need to make sure that all these folks are ready here on the radio station. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the album chat for the time we're doing this album chat tonight. For what time is it? Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause and welcome to the one and only Jellybean Johnson's in the house. What you doing, brother? How you doing, man? What's up, Chris? <laughs> What's hey, man. Up? What's up, man? Surprise, surprise. See, I see. I try to keep all this stuff on the down low. It's just so difficult to keep secrets nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing, man? Just hanging, man. You know, the only thing getting me through this craziness is prayer and exercise, baby. So it's your exercise <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I heard you were just out on a bike ride, so that's gotta yeah. be. Uh, yeah, that's gotta be. Yeah, man. Every so. day, every day, gotta do it, man. Otherwise, I'd lose my damn mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So when you heard, I don't know if you were even paying attention, but when you heard that the album was going to be released, that when the album was released today, 38 years ago to the day, what does that even process in your head? Does it feel like it's been 38 years that's gone by? Chris, it just makes me feel just how old I really am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bro, I, I just just show I've been around here a long time. You know? <laughs> I can only imagine. Man. I, I just can't. I mean, I remember when this album came out. I remember where I was. I remember where I was living. I remember hearing it on the radio. And I was, I, when I heard thirty eight years, I was like really, it was <laughs> thirty eight years. No. Every time one of these anniversaries comes up, it's just amazing to me. I, you know, I've been going through it recently too because now, the, you know, the family's is thirty five, and it's this month too. So I got to do some stuff with them, like on Friday. But yeah, man, it's oh god. <laughs> <laughs> I read something that Prince was kind of on this controversy tour, and I think what it ended up happening is that you guys did a show. Uh, there was a show that was done in Minneapolis in yeah. a in a venue that seated like about 15,000 or something like that. And only about a third of the venue showed up. Yeah. And that kind of put Prince in this mode where he kind of felt like he really needed to prove something and and just kind of was just in this really frazzled mode to kind of really pump out this next you yeah. know, this next step. And yeah. do you remember everything that was going on during that period of time and, and, you know, how you guys felt as far as, you know, what was about to happen? Did you kind of see that this, you were, it was about to world when was about to happen at this point? You know, we, we, uh, wow. It, it's so long ago, bro. But, yeah. You know, I just remember the, the four, the first two and from the first album and stuff. Um, and, it, it was cool and everything, but, you know, we he knew we had to, you know, make a, another big step. And see, the thing people don't realize, we were like Prince's R&B side. You know, we was the the the, the R&B black band he always wanted to be in. Right. So we were like, you know, his alter ego, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so all his funk, you know, all his funk and, and booty shaking music, you know, he would, like, tend to give to us. And, you know, but he knew for him to cross over, he had to do Low Red Corvette and all that. He had to get the white people on his side. So he had to do, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, so I knew this was coming, man, but I just didn't, you know, I didn't realize to what extent we had just got off the big tour, you know, the, the first album, with the first album and stuff. And I was just kind of waiting to see what happened and stuff. And uh, and then I started to hear some of the tracks that was coming out and I was like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> when I heard some of the tracks to, uh, to what time is it? I was like, oh my God, this is, this, you know, this is a whole step up from the first record, so. Yeah, did you kind of feel like, um, you know, I, I know we're gonna we're we're gonna talk about this in the album chat, but I knew that if you if you ever got the opportunity to actually hang out for the album chat, I wanted to make sure if you didn't get a chance, I wanted to ask you about seven 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 ninety three eleven and how difficult that song was to kind of 
<laughs> yeah, because it, it's not the easiest song. It, it, it wasn't. The, well, Chris, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. It was. It was no day at the beach, and you gotta realize that's the that was the first single off. What time is it? And uh, and I never forget we was rehearsing uh for the 1999 tour, and uh, and we knew we were gonna be in the middle, you know, an open advantage six is gonna open, and we was gonna be in the middle. So I remember one day distinctly we were rehearsing at the convention center downtown. You know, we had you know. Prince put the whole production thing, you know, that's how he would do it. And we, we rehearsed a good month before we even went out. But I remember me, him, and Morris sitting down at my drum kit, man, and figuring out how in the hell is Jelly Bean going to play this beat in concert and have these guys dance and do all the, you know, the cool, we had, you know, we had thought of cool ass dances, you know, the four corners and all that stuff for it. But to be able to pull that off every night in concert was going to be a challenge for me because, you know, that that beat is a David Garibaldi beat who, by the way, me and, uh, you know, me and Morris grew up idolizing him. To Prince too. We we grew up idolizing Tower of Power. Yeah. So, uh, and Garibaldi had designed that beat, and Prince made the song around it. So, but uh, it's almost in, inhumanly possible, impossible to play that beat. <laughs> you know, like it is a drum machine. Even though I, I you know, I got a lot of world class drum friends that have done it over the years, and I've been doing it forty years. But, you know, that that is that beat is very very challenging. And you know, I always tell drummers, you want to, you know, you want to work on your chops, learn that beat. Yeah, <laughs> and it was funny because one of the things that I mentioned in the album chat when we when we do the album chat, one of the things that we mentioned is is that uh, Questlove had mentioned that he spent the better part of three months trying to learn that beat because it's very off kilter. Yeah, but yeah. What, and and he it's said not, it's he not spent, your basic two and four is not. Yeah, and so you know, and that was a question and, I was going to ask. That was a question I was going to ask because I'm not a drummer. Chris, yeah, two and four is in there, but it's subtle. You know the hand claps are doing the two and four for you. The beat is all is off kilter, but the hand claps is giving you the two and four. So you know, so that's what you're shaking your butt to, you know. And right. you got this cool ass beat going, but you got the hand claps going too on two and four. So you know, and that's how you dance to it. But most people don't get that, you know. Yeah, it's I, I just can't. Yeah, and as somebody who's not a drummer, that's what I could. I was like, it, it seems pretty normal but then even as me not being a drummer if i try to like yeah know, yeah go through the motions I, yeah. I just i just i just can't do it i just can't do it so now you, is it just gotta, pretty much you kind of have to be an octopus to play that beat this is bottom line <laughs> well and and is it is it second nature now for you when you get behind it you just yeah after 40 nature? years yeah after 40 years is second nature but trust me <laughs> It wasn't in the beginning, trust me. It was not. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. And I know that there was a lot of things that were going on, you know, especially during the triple, well, not the triple threat tour, when everything was going on as far as the the competition between, you know, when you guys would get on and and hammer out these these thirty minute sets that were just loaded, yeah, yeah, yeah with yeah. these amazing songs. And then what ended up happening is that you know it, it was just one of those scenarios where. Prince was just getting increasingly frustrated because he kept on feeling like you were, you were in a position where uh, you guys were just outperforming him. Do you remember what the set list was that you were? I mean, I, I think we could probably obviously look it up, but do you remember well, what the set list was? Well, that the first out? album, man, we 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 frustrated him so much on the first album, man, because we was we was whooping that ass, man. Because you got to realize, Chris, that's the only satisfaction we were getting, because we wasn't getting rich. The only one was making decent money was Moore's. And you know, and Prince wasn't exactly the nicest guy, so so you know, that was our only way was them forty minutes or thirty minutes or whatever to get back at him or at least have some sanity and feel good about yourself was you know was those 30, 40 minutes that we had, and it was funny because the more and more we got successful and more and more the crowd you know got into us and everything, the less and less space we got on stage every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I heard you. And how do I mean? What was it like? Be, I mean, every night it'd be a little, would be a little bit closer to the edge of the stage. I would, <laughs> my drum rising would disappear. The drums would be down on the floor. Monty what? and Jimmy be next to you know, right next to me on the side. You know, they might still be on their risers, but I'd be down on the floor when normally, you know, all three of us would be on risers. But it'd be less and less every night till you know. Till finally, he stopped doing that. But it was, we thought it was funny. Are you serious? See, I had heard that. I mean, I had heard the the harder stuff, like removing you guys from Billings and some of the bigger cities well, yeah, and stuff like that. <laughs> but you know, what I didn't know is when you were moved off of Billings, that you still had to go and perform 
as the band behind Vanity Six. I yeah. was not. I and wasn't that, aware of that part. Chris, that was heartbreaking. I'm not gonna lie. And 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 the and the, the, the places that that happened at was the two biggest markets. It was New York and L.A. And I'll never forget. Uh, and I said this in the original sevens. Uh, we, you know, we had this documentary and everything. But I was, t- I just remember sitting there in New York and uh, in L.A. And Chris, every major star you could think of was backstage in the dressing room. You know, the, you know, wanting to talk to her, see us, and all that stuff. And the time wasn't even on the bill. We was just backing up Vanity Six. <sighs> <laughs> And I just remember, I just, well, I was so heartbroken by that. But, you know, once again, that just helped us whoop his ass even more <laughs> when we were in concert with him. You know, when we did show up, you know, we would tear that ass up because that's just the only, you know, you know, retribution we were getting back from it, you know, because, you know, it, that's how it was. He was the man. He was in charge. It was his stage. It was his show. And here with the two biggest markets, the, you know, um, I never forget Sting, uh, Magic Johnson, <sighs> uh, just every major star, Wesley Snipes, just you know, just everybody in our dressing room, and they want to see the time, and the time's not performing that night, you know, the, the, the time is incognito behind Vanity Six. <laughs> <laughs> behind, behind a fish net curtain with pink stockings and shit. You know, we back there behind there with you know playing for their ass. You know. Oh my god. <laughs> you, you just said that? you just said that. <laughs> yeah. No, that happened, Chris. That happened. That happened. And the the other guys at the time, most of them would tell you, some of them maybe won't, but most of them would tell you that happened. I guarantee you. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. So so this album comes out. We're gonna be. I'm gonna be walking through uh, some of the the tracks on this album tonight. And okay. once again, for those of you who are listening on online on the radio station uh, around the world, they're going, "Hey, who's talking?" Uh, I'd like to welcome the one and only Jellybean Johnson to the show. He's not going to be hanging out for the album chat. We've got like 20 minutes with him, so yeah. we are like spending some time just kind of hanging out and talking a little bit. And uh, he's still out and about and still actively playing shows. I heard that Tuesday night was like your night to actually go out and kind of play some live shows. What where, Whereabouts are you playing well, in Minneapolis and around? What are you doing? There's a blues jam here every Tuesday night. So, oh, you know, nice. And, you know, I, anybody that knows me, you know, privately know that I'm a, I, I love the blues, you know, because I come from, I was born in Chicago. Uh, I have a lot of friends in Chicago, a lot of uh, blues greats I was around and stuff. Uh, and the Brooks, you know, the Brooks family, Wayne Baker Brooks, Ronnie Baker Brooks, Lonnie Brooks. Oh, man, and yeah. so, uh, you know, I did uh, Ronnie's first three albums and they're all Chicago blues, you know, and stuff. So, so I love the blues. So, and you know, with this pandemic going on, Chris, there's limited things you can do here live. It is very mm. limited. I have a, a local band here called JB and the Routine. We're playing this weekend. You know, that's one of the few live shows we're doing. We're playing next weekend too. But, you know, it's just like, you just got to get in and, where you can fit in right now and this very and and then the other thing too there the, the shows are only seven to ten o'clock well you know i'm used to you know at least yeah. midnight you know <laughs> yeah i've <laughs> seen you know, i've seen you a few times you know? no. i've seen you yeah i've That's seen you up weird, in your bro. up in your hometown you play till two yeah, three four o'clock yeah. in the morning I- something wrong if, I, if, I, <laughs> you know, if i'm back home by 10 something wrong <laughs> <laughs> So we got all these people. I know that, you know, what I want to do is I definitely want to give people the opportunity to be able to ask you some questions. We've got a bunch of people that that are saying hello. Okay. Uh, you got hello from uh, Cammie Mattingly says hello. Jackie says hello. Okay. Uh, Sylvia, Jill Norman, Susan, Lenny, Lenny Beeson says, what's up, Jelly Bean? Matter of fact, you said get in where you fit in. That's Lenny Beeson's uh, saying. He says that all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Terry says hello. Trisha says hello. Manny says, I wanted I wanted baggy pants and Stacy Adams. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You guys set a precedent. Because hey, I, I remember when I had a picture that I was showing uh, not too long ago of me, and it was because 1985 or 86, wearing a pink suit. Like top to bottom, yeah, Jesse and it was Johnson, all huh? Jesse Johnson's fault. <laughs> Be your man. <laughs> I the, when I first met Jesse Johnson, I happened to have that picture on my phone, and I showed it to him, and I said, "You see what you did? <laughs> you see what you did?" He goes, "Oh man, don't blame that That's on great. me." That's great. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and so Manny said he wanted those baggy pants and uh, Stacy Adams, and uh, let's see. April says. 
Hello. Hey, Jelly Bean from Tampa. I met you at Prince 60th birthday celebration. Your meet and greet. Oh, There's... wow. Yeah, I remember that. Yikes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When, of course, Letty says uh, 777 is a classic. Vinyl Jeopardy says, Jelly Bean, thanks for coming. And he says, we're all old. Yes, that's course. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Cammy says, seeing Jelly Bean is on my bucket list. You got to. You got to. You got to get it in. <laughs> so, again, yeah, I don't see any other questions. I don't see any questions on here. If you guys have any questions for Jelly Bean, we only got like about 10 more minutes left. If you guys have any questions, go ahead ahead and get them out and let's let's get him the questions while we got them on here uh and kind of while i got you since we're talking about what time is it you know what are some of the standout songs i mean obviously seven 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 ninety three eleven is really <coughs> kind of in a class all its own because that song is not a state you know just from a beat standpoint and just from a song structure standpoint exactly is is it's definitely a standalone what are some of the other songs one of the other five on this album yeah, yeah. That, that really stand out to you. Well, and for me, uh, well, I, you know, and on the first album, and I was just telling someone, me and you know, me and Jeff radio show, stage, uh, show every Wednesday night, I was just talking about that. I remember on the first album, and still to this day, we're in concert. When the time's in concert, more than the time's in concert. I always could tell how the audience is going to go, uh, how the audience is reacting to us. But when we get to cool, we get to the song cool. I just I you know why I'm 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 playing the beat and I can just see how people are reacting. And that lets me know what kind of night we're usually gonna have. So that's that's a staple song for the time for most of the time. The other one for me, the challenging song for me is uh is the walk in concert, you know, because really? it has such a distinct, you know, intro. Morse, you know, Morris is a is a world class drummer and he's he I always said he's the closest to David Garibaldi that I've heard out here. And stuff, and uh, I even told Gary Body that, but <laughs> but yeah, but uh, it, it has a distinct intro to it, and it's funny, you know, the few times that I've been, uh, you know, when Morris has had to get a sub for me when I had the out way off the lux, I had some other stuff to do. Then he always takes that song out of the set because the drum, uh, the drum beat is so distinctive in the intro and stuff that most drummers cannot get that for some reason. It's kind of like seven seven. You know, right. the, the, the intro just throws them off when they try to do it. And I've seen guys try to do it, and I just kind of chuckled, you know. So. <laughs> That's got to be funny. So you get to – well, I know, like, when you do, like, the Jelly Bean uh, Johnson experience, some, sometimes you do that uh, in Minneapolis where you have, like, a whole bunch of bands that kind of yeah, come yeah. in, and, yeah, and they yeah. want to kind of redo some of the stuff. And, yeah. and you're like, um, you know, it's got to be – it's got to be funny to kind of see bands' interpretations of, of your work. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, you, and you know, it's funny too, Chris, because I've seen some great interpretations of us and I've seen some horrible ones. I, I bet you and, have. You know, and <laughs> you, have to, you have to hold your tongue, you know, because you have to give them at least credit for at least you try, you know, but. Yeah, I, like I said, I've seen some great ones and I've seen some horrible ones, man. So yeah. right, we're here, I've got some questions. I know the answer to this question, but I'll let you answer it anyways. We're going to cover it in the album chat as well. Um, Mary. Uh, Arad says, "Was it was it Dez's phone number seven 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 ninety three eleven? You know what? I think it was. I think it was. Yeah. But he had to change it almost immediately after, yeah. after that <laughs> song came out. He had to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. We'll be talking about that on the album. That it was <laughs> Dez's phone number, and uh, Prince called him on the phone and, and was talking to him, and I guess played played a little bit of it. And when when Dez heard it on the heard it over the phone, he was like." I'm gonna have to change my phone number. Change my phone number. Yeah, <laughs> it's and he not did. gonna go yeah. well." <laughs> See only, see, only Prince had a warped sense of humor like that. You know, he didn't even ask this. He didn't even asked this. He just went made a damn song and then called him up and said, hey, man, let's check this out. Okay. Now, probably was probably was cracked, doubled up laughing and shit. You know, I'm like, dude. Yeah. How long have you had your existing phone number? Oh, wow. The one I got now? Oh, my God. At least about 30, 35 years, man. Oh, okay. So what would happen... <laughs> If that happened again and Prince made a song using your phone number that you have now that you have 35 years, how would right. you handle that? But he, me and him would get into it because, you know, we, we used to, <laughs> we had a very contentious relationship, but we loved each other. You oh, know, my God. He know he, he, know he would get an old-fashioned Jelly B. Johnson cussing out, you know, <laughs> but I'd change my phone number. I'd have to do it, you yeah. know. Andre yeah. says, how much did you learn from Prince? That's kind of a loaded question for sure, I imagine. Yeah, it's a loaded one. Uh I learned a lot, bro. He made me famous. I learned a lot. Uh, I, I stole a lot from him. He don't know to this day. I'm, I'm sure he chuckles some of the times when he hear my productions and stuff. I'm sure he heard, well, I know where he got that lick from, or I know where he got that <laughs> idea from. 
but uh <laughs> I, I stole a lot from him, you know. I, I, you know, I've been, I've been blessed to be around some really, you know, talented guys that I took a lot from. I took a lot from Jimmy Terry. I took a lot from Jesse Johnson. I took a lot of guitar tricks from Jesse and Prince, you know. So, you know, I, you know, I use their stuff on them. I use it against them. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, and you've got some it's great all, new. All, all is fear and love and war, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got some great new stuff that that's out there now. I put some jelly on it, all the stuff. Tell people about some of the stuff that you're working on now that that uh, they can pick up now that you have. Yeah, I, I have three singles out now. The first one is put some jelly on it, uh, and the cool thing about put some jelly on it is it's the Minneapolis funk, but it has the Chicago horns on it. Uh, we use uh, Tom Tom Washington, who's famous for Earth, Wind, and Fire, and all the, mm -hmm. the Chicago soul bands. He's a right. horn, famous horn arranger, and we got him. I got him to put the horn arrangement and put some jelly on it. You know, and the reason of that, Chris, is because Flight Time, as a as a 15, 16 year old kid in Flight Time, we had five, six horns players when we were coming up. Flight Time was a horn band, right? So you know, so so I always wanted that sound. You know, I you know I kind of got away from it during my years and the time and my productions and stuff like that. So when it got time for me to do my own thing, you know, and I had a chance to put some horn players on something, I was like, wow, let's do it. And then when I heard it, I was like, oh, I was blown away, you know. And then to have somebody iconic like Tom Tom, you know, come up with a horn arrangement like that was great. I mean, I had yeah. done horn I got horn arrangements done. You know, I did a song on Janet Jackson called What Like Do. I used horn players for that stuff, but that was a different local guy that I used for horn arrangements for that. But this Tom Tom is iconic, man. He really is. And, yeah, then, and, there, and there's plenty of talented bands. There's a band out of Minneapolis, and you're probably familiar with them, Foe. Uh huh. Oh uh, yeah, they're friends of mine. Yeah. Yeah, those kids, man. Let me tell you something. They're they're young cats, but they you want to talk about? Hell. Yeah, they, oh my they gosh. Are joke, man. I told him right now, I said, the only thing holding you guys back, you guys need to get a lead singer. And he's like, Bing, yeah, we know. I said, Yeah, you should get a horn singer. Lead singer, you, you know, you got all the tracks, you got all, you know, they do a lot of fusion and instrumentals and stuff, but they should get a lead singer and they would really just go to the next level. I really yeah. I've told them that. Yeah. Yeah, foes not to be messed with for sure. No. I know you already you already answered this question. Uh, William F. Carter says, "What up, Jelly Bean? What is your favorite time song, either that you recorded or to play live?" I know you mentioned Cool, but is there something else that maybe maybe those are two separate things? Maybe one that you recorded that you're really proud of your work. I mean, well, I know the, that Prince the, recorded a lot of stuff, but I'm yeah, talking Prince, about Prince and Morris played the the, mo yeah. the bulk of the drums. But you know, I, I'm proud of the bird. The bird is me. You know, so, you know, I, I always like playing that in concert, but so you can see how people lose their mind the minute we break into that. So, so but yeah, probably the bird. And, uh, you know, I like playing cool live. I like playing the wall, you know, back in the yeah. early days, when we only had, you know, a few songs. We, I, we, you know, Morse put so many licks in that. So we used to play them all in concert. We used to play the whole song. So I used yeah. to always have to stay on top. It was like, it was kind of like seven, seven. It was a challenge to play all the licks that Mo had played, you know, and get them right in concert and stuff. So, yeah, it's a little, it's, some of that stuff is real tricky when you try to, you know, actually kind of do some work. This is actually probably a loaded question. Uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't cause any, any controversy. Uh, but why didn't the original seven really take off? I think we kind of knew that, you know, Jesse kind of stepped away as far because he didn't feel like you guys were moving quick enough to, you know, to set up the touring and whatever. But what what happened with the original seven as far as, you know, why weren't you guys able to keep moving forward? It was it, it was heartbreaking, baby. I just, you know, I, I, I kind of probably shouldn't get into it now. That is such a sore subject. with I, me. I, 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 it, and, yeah, and I know I, a lot I, of people I, saying, why did you guys have to do name yourself original seven, too? There's always been a question about that, about why yeah, yeah. It, it, it's 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 a loaded question and uh, trust me one day i'm gonna tell the truth of why and i got my own opinion on why i shouldn't and and the powers that be know why you know this this happened so i'm gonna just yeah. leave it like that for now Chris. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now here's what i can tell here's what i can tell you my folks is shit, man. Come on. yeah here's what i can tell jeff smith if you've got the album condensate there is a dvd in there you can oh yeah go you can load the dvd, load the DVD. Can... it doesn't tell you why it happened. <laughs> but you get a pretty good idea <laughs> but you get an idea uh, kind of yeah but there, there's definitely some some definite reasons why that record did not do what it should have done yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it also has to do with marketing and placement, and just it's radio yeah, is yeah. a totally different beast now. So there's it's a lot just, of people at fault for that. It's a yeah, lot yeah. of Powers that be that's at fault for that. Is Jelly Bean Johnson related to Terry Terrence jo Jackson? Or no, Johnson? Terry Terrence Jackson. I grew up with him. He was in Grand Central. He's a good friend of mine. He's a percussionist. Uh, he was in Grand Central with Prince when Prince was there. He grew up with Morris. 
and uh, you know, he just he's a bad man, but he, we're not related. <laughs> uh, let's, let's see. Lenny said, I was at the food fight show in Cincinnati after the gig was the time and the revolution on separate tour buses. Yeah, we were, we fought like cats and dogs, but we were on, uh, we're on separate buses. Uh, Chris got mad. <laughs> <laughs> Chris was mad at us cause we whooped their ass about that whole thing, you know, and, and, uh, and he made, he charged Morris a bunch of money for all the damages that happened, you know, but. It needed to happen, man. It had been brewing. And like I told you before, Chris, that's the, you know, that was the only thing we had. Cause like I said, we wasn't making a bunch of money. And and you know, after a while, you know, you you only could take so much, you know. So right. And you know, he, he they had done some some terrible things to some, you know. Matter of fact, they 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 took Jesse off stage while we were in concert, took him backstage, handcuffed him to the bed to the thing in the room, <laughs> put poured food all over him. So I, that was I the heard right there to get his ass, get the asses whooped for that. It, yeah, I, they, Jerome poured syrup all over his head. Oh and just, my you know, God. And we're in concert. <laughs> yes, we're in concert. People don't even know what's going on. Uh, so, I know, heard Chris it, got mad at me years ago, years later when I was telling people that, you know what I'm saying when I'm there, but I didn't care. You know, dude, come on, man. You know, he knew. I heard in Chick's book, Chick Consperry, Big uh -huh. Chick, his, he's got a book called White Slave. I don't know if you've seen it. No. Uh, where, White Slave being that he was a slave to cocaine. Yeah. He, but yeah, he was he actually talked about the excerpt. <laughs> he just agreed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was an excerpt in there where he was talking about that show, and he said, what did he say? He, he talked about how furious that Jesse Johnson was oh at that moment. Because he, Chris, Jesse Johnson was like, it dude, was bad. Dude, Jesse found some <laughs> otherworldly strength, man. He pulled the coat rack that they had him attached to, handcuffed to, he snatched it out of the wall. That's how mad his ass was. And we don't, you know, we don't, we are constant. We don't know what the hell's going on. We look up, he's back. They got him backstage. All the revolution's doing that to him. Prince ass is on stage playing with us, playing the guitar with us. Oh no. Knowing what's going on. Knowing the whole time he's behind this. Oh no. And that's the thing. So yeah. So <laughs> oh yeah, my yeah. god. I've been through it, bro. These people just don't know. They I've been through it. <laughs> Uh, I know we got to wrap it up. I got we just got like a few more questions. Mary, yeah. Mary said, "When did you last get to see Prince?" We about <laughs> about January of sixteen, uh, man. We played a show uh, at, at Paisley. He 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 uh, he had us. He summoned us and stuff. And and trust me, Morris was reluctant to do it, but you know he made Prince send the money ahead of time and in advance and all that. And me. During this time, I'm gonna tell a little side story about this too. During this time, we did this for about six months. Me and Morris was making the switch in concert, whereas I he would go back and play the drums, and I would go out front and play the guitar and and play like you know I played like the intro to Black Cat and play some Hendrix licks and all that. Oh, really cool. So we were doing that right. So he gets the call from Morris. He gets the call from Prince. Like Prince wants us to play at Paisley. When Morris is like, send the money, you know, and, and you know. <laughs> So he sent the money. So then I'm thinking about, okay. So now granted, Chris, I don't know if you remember this. About a few months prior to this, I seen Prince on TV uh, with his girl band. And he had played on, I, I can't, uh, it was a Fallon, whatever, whatever band. Who's the band, the Roots, Chris Love and them? That's Jimmy Fallon's. Jimmy Fallon, yeah. Fallon. Okay. Tonight show, yeah. So yeah. So Prince was on TV with them and their guitar players let him use their guitar. Right, and right. he broke it that night and too. And he destroyed that. Bus, man. <laughs> it was a. It he, was a collection. It was like, I dude, I like <laughs> lost my damn mind. I was like, really? Did he? Yeah, that was that was on national TV to this boy's guitar. Yeah, that was Captain That's, Kirk's guitar from Captain the Roots. Captain Kirk. That's a Captain it was, Kirk's it, cool it, brother. It, it, um, you see me wearing the I, shirt? I'm wearing yeah, the shirt I, right man, here. I, man, <laughs> so. With all this <laughs> shit was going on, he was calling us to play us, uh, and more, me and Morris was doing the switch. I told Morris, I pulled Morris aside. We were in a city a couple cities before, a couple nights before. And I tell him, I say, dude, I say, I need you to have my back. I say, because if Prince destroys my guitar <laughs> while we're at Paisley, it's going to be in the papers, bro. It's going to be on the National Wire. It's going to be an inquiry. It's going to be on everything, TM, TMZ, everything. It's going to be because they're going to see the real North Side come out in Jelly Bean. Yeah, and, uh, I, I I can't even imagine. Well, that was actually like a, a a 
classic guitar too that was yeah, not it was, just it was like a 61 one epiphone it was a yeah. one. Oh. It cost thousands of oh dollars. God. And now, mind you, Chris, he said the dude, he said Captain a nice ass guitar. Because, you know, that wasn't the first time he had destroyed another cat's guitar. He had done that. Now, <sighs> I, you know what? I've seen him do it. I'd, I'd seen him get mad one time. You know those love symbol guitars? Yeah. I'd seen him. He fell one time in concert here. And wow. I'd seen him destroy one of them, too. I've been lucky enough to be on stage and play one of those with him. But he fell one time, and he literally destroyed that damn thing in front of 20,000 people. Wow, so, I've never so, seen him fall. <laughs> yeah, he fell and hurt himself really bad. I, yeah, so, wow, really? I don't... So, wow. so anyway, that was my whole <clears throat> side story about us. And then, so we played, you know, and, and we did the switch and everything. And it was great and everything. And he got Morris, he him Morris up for two hours after that show. And talked to him and told him a lot of stuff what I'm not going to get into right now. But... Uh, right. It was, you know, and that was the last time, I, you know, that we were around him. And then, you know, that was it. So, yeah, I, oof. Well, yeah, there's, there's plenty of stories, man. <laughs> hey, uh, I got the stories, Chris. I, you yeah, know, I, just, I ain't put them uh, out and, yet, but I got yeah. them. Trust me. Anne says, Are there time recordings in the vault at Paisley Park? Yes, I, 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 yes, I, can, I know the answer to the question. Yeah, yes, we know. Yeah. Go, wait, yeah, Corp. I want to ask you a question. I've always wanted to ask this question, and I, since I got you, I know Corporate World is an album that kind of ended up kind of getting split between Pandemonium and, and yeah, Graffiti yeah. Bridge. And there were some other tracks that were kind of yeah. lost in there, like that title yeah. track. At one point in time, I'd stumbled on a website that there was that said that there was a time album called Old Dogs New Tricks. Yeah, that's that's in that's that that's part of the, the catalog that's in the vault. You know, it's all kind of it's so there is an album called Old. There, there is an album it, by the time called Old Dog I know New there's Tricks. A song I don't know if they was gonna name the whole album that, but there's a song that's that that's there. It's a whole bunch of stuff. You remember, Corporate Dick was originally was gonna be just Jerome and Morris. Yeah, and okay. then Jimmy and Terry got involved, and then Jimmy and Terry went to Warner Brothers and wanted to, you know, and said we should the whole band should do it. So we got Prince. That's one of the few times in his lifetime he agreed with us, and we got together, and that's how Pandemonium was born. Mm. You know, we, uh, we ended up doing Pandemonium instead, you know, and we took some of those songs from, you know, Corporate World and put, you know, it's right. two songs, you know, that I never forget going to Paisley and hanging out with Prince. And he asked us, you know, what songs we wanted from him. And I, I distinctly told him Jerk Out and Chocolate. So I know th we got those two from him. And then we did other stuff. You know, the original guys had us. Jesse had stuff. Jimmy Terry, you know, had stuff. And that's what ended up being Pandemonium. So uh, as far as you guys questions, I, I, I know we got we got two more questions and I'm going to cut it off because I know I know you got a show to do. Man, I wish I was up there to see that. It would be amazing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because I haven't seen a concert since hey, February. Man, shut down all the man. Ain't no live oh gigs gosh. right now, man. You can you know what, too? Chris is killing me, man. I You know, I got YouTube TV and all that shit. You get tired of watching. There's yeah. only so many shows you can watch. You can only so I can't watch. You can watch yourself in concert. You want to play. I like to play. Uh, it's I, yeah, hard it, to watch all the old time shows. I watched a show from us in 91, man, over in Japan. You know, I was yeah. like, I forgot all about it. You know, and I was like, damn. <laughs> you know, I forgot all the arrangements and everything. I was like, damn. <laughs> uh, Maisha asks, what is your favorite venue in Chi-Town and when can we see you there? Well, obviously, you know, the question of when can we see you there is going to be when this well, yeah, thing freaking lets they up. They got some real problems going on in Chi-Town right now, man. I just, yeah, yeah. it just breaks my heart, man. It just breaks my heart. I, wow. It's so, so many of the iconic blues clubs there. There's Buddy Guys Legends. There's uh, yep. Kingston Mines. There's mm -hmm. Blues. All those places are great, iconic places, but you can't go. You can't go there right now. You know, it, they had they show one picture. They had broke, you know, Buddy's windows out of his club and stuff. Oh, like that's eighty four damn years old, man. He'll need that. Nah. And there's all kind of legendary. He had to take all his Grammys and gold records and platinum records off the wall and all. You know, he had merchandise. Oh, he had to take all this stuff, iconic guitars from different iconic guitar players. He had to take all that stuff down, and put it on storage. Because well, at least he got it. Whole... It didn't get stolen. No, but they would loot. They were they, you know, they just looted. Mis ma ma uh, what is it called? Magnific, uh, magnific set. It's a stretch of stores there, man. Iconic stores. They just <clears> looted <throat> the hell out of them, man. It's just, <sighs> it's just sad. Michigan Avenue, man, is all boarded up. It's just sad. It's it's, mm. it's absolutely sad. But but this is where we are today, you know. Adam Laurie says, "What other new artists are you listening to?" I like Kingfish. You know, Christian Kingfish. Yeah. Uh, I like Gary Clark Jr. 
Oh yeah, Gary uh, Clark. Yeah, oh, I love Gary Clark. It's, oh, it's a, but Eric Gales, you know, it's those those are the kind of guys I'm listening to right now, man. They they inspire me. You know, they they're the new breed, they're 21st century. You know, and th that's the kind of stuff I'm listening to right now. Um, and I'm sure I'm leaving somebody else. You know, I, I'm, I like Stokely. Yes. You know, Stokely got his new stuff out. You know. Yep. So I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And prayers up for Chance Howard. Prayers, prayers for Chance. That's my my big bro. He was in terrible accident, man, and he's still trying to. He's still in recovery mode. And uh, yeah, I miss him. He's on my. He's on the Jelly Bean Johnson Experience record that's coming out. Yep. You know, that's so. where I brought him up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Last question: How would Jelly Bean Johnson teach someone to learn the drums? Oh man, Chris, I get asked to teach all the time. My my skills are from the street, so it's hard to sit down and physically show, you know, tell somebody what to play, you know. My mother, man, when I was uh when I was a kitty, I was a little shorty, man, around 12, 13. She did like six months of, of drum lessons for me. And all the dude wanted to teach me was Jerry Lee Lewis and and uh rock and roll drums and shit. Well, Chris, I was from Chicago, man. I wanted to learn James Brown, Clyde Stubblefield, you know, David Gary right. Hardy, that kind of stuff. So I made her stop, you know, have she I made her take me out of lessons after like six months because I wasn't learning what I was needed to learn, man. So and then I just got woodshedded. I laid down at my st mom's stereo and put my ear to the stereo and started mimicking the beats. You know that I was hearing on these different iconic records, on all the James Brown records and Tyler Power records, and uh, yeah, and, that and I think Cold Blood, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff, man. All the greatest drummers do the exact same thing. They learn, they learn the the you know they learn the favorite you know just learn your favorite music because yeah, it, yeah. that's what you're passionate about. That's what you yeah. want to recreate. That's, that's, you, that's yeah. the best way to do it. Yeah, you said the, the magic word. They're passionate because when you're passionate about something, you're gonna put in the time. You know, sure, it's sure technically, you know, drum lessons are great. They do all the paradiddles and all the different technical stuff. You learn that. But you really learn when you put your, when you're passionate about something and you're trying to figure out how this guy is doing that on that record. Yep. And that's, that's, that's who I was. That's how I learned, you know. <laughs> and like to Questlove, so he was spent three months learning it before he found out that it was a drum machine. A oh, drum machine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, and I tell people that, that that drum beat made me, it made me famous, you know, but it's a drum machine you know they they still yeah. to this day it's amazing how many drummers actually think you know and then they come see me play i get pretty close in concert but you know, that's the thing you know if that goes back to what we were just talking about if you're passionate about something you're going to learn how to play it where you know people are going to accept it and it's acceptable you know so. right and i'll be beside myself my good friend nick garcia nick argelia and elena day say hello to jelly bean so he sent me a text so i got Oh, Thanks, so how you <laughs> Jelly Bean, thank you so much for joining us, man. It's really, really cool. We're gonna for you, Chris. You know, you know that. You know, man. you know I love you. Yeah, I love you too, yeah, brother. Yeah. Uh, we need to get you on when you got some time. Maybe not on a Tuesday night. We're gonna have to spend some time hanging out because I know you got some stories, and I'll I'll, stories, I'll, I'll try to not get you in trouble. I've been through I'll try it. to I'm, not get I'm you trying in to trouble. Stay out of trouble with management right now. <laughs> I don't want no. You know, I, I got a life for, uh, uh, separate from this, man, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, man. But uh, I'm, I'm looking no forward extra, to it. You know? Everybody yeah, head over to Jelly Beans. Talk, Chris, you'll know. You'll know. I, 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 I better know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody head over. You got a brand new website, jellybean-johnson.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that is, it's looking good. And obviously you got, you know, some new stuff coming out. You got want to keep, and if you happen to be in the Minneapolis area, you should probably, you know, not watch the album chat, just watch it later and head out to wherever Jelly Bean's going. Where's it going to be tonight? <laughs> huh? Where's it going to be tonight? Uh, it's called uh, it's a blues club here called Waleski's. It's a Waleski's Waleski. blues club. It's blues jam, yeah. On so if you happen to be in Minneapolis, then you Saint can go ahead and cut out and head over to Waleski's. Yeah, St. <laughs> Paul. St. Paul, Minneapolis. St. Paul, Paul, Minnesota. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brother, it's an honor. Thank you so, so much for stopping in, man. All right. Take care of yourself, Chris. Be, take care. Be cool. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>